All right, well, this evening, let's begin by reading the parable. Um, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And there are a lot of details, of course, in here. We're not going to try to um, understand necessarily all the details, and, and I don't think it's necessarily meant in that way, but certainly the main movements of the parable, each of them have significance, and those are the things we want to um, pay attention to. So let's read it to begin with, beginning in verse 11. And he, that is Jesus, said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered uh, everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began <clears throat> to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his, his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in, in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes... You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, there is a lot in here. We're obviously not going to be able to spend a great deal of time in here, but I hope we'll see some encouragements. There's always encouragements in the Word of God. Now, again, just want to remind you this morning, we were seeing how Jesus reproved the scribes and Pharisees for their lack of concern of their more distant uh, countrymen uh, through these three parables, two of which we've already considered. They were offended that Jesus had received and ate with the tax collectors and the sinners, something Jesus was telling them that they should have been doing. I mean, they were the shepherds of Israel, after all. If they really cared for the sheep, then they would be the ones going after them. If they valued them as silver, which is how Jesus values his people, they would search for these lost coins. Well, that's what Jesus was doing with the tax collectors and the uh, sinners who were gathered with him. He left the 99 sheep in the fold. He left the nine coins, as it were, in the purse to search for the one that was lost. And Jesus was telling us this morning that in the same way, we should be concerned. We should be concerned about everything that has to do with what the Lord has called us to do. We should be concerned about our worship, that we worship Him faithfully. Discipleship, that we're being discipled and perhaps being instrumental in discipling others. And of course, in our service towards one another, which is very important, we need one another to build each other up. 
But we should also be concerned, perhaps most concerned, about those who are still outside the fold who need to be brought in. We should be concerned about seeking the lost. Now this evening, let's look at the third parable, that of the prodigal son. And Jesus here is again teaching us about the importance of seeking the lost, I think you understand. But he does add a few things in here that he doesn't necessarily include in the others. May not be that they, they weren't there by implication, but he does spell them out a little bit more clearly here. Now, I've already mentioned there are several ways that we could apply this passage. We could certainly apply it to ourselves because we are all at one time or another prodigals in a sense. We were lost. We were uh, without hope, without God in the world, but the Lord brought us near. We could apply it to the many that are out there yet that the Lord has yet to gather in uh, to his family. We could apply this certainly to evangelism. But this evening, I think it would be useful to us and perhaps encouraging to apply it to our homes since the, the parable itself actually does deal with a household in which there are two sons, one of which remains and the other which, of course, leaves. I think we can apply it to our children that we have raised in the Lord that have not yet come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would like for us this evening to consider three things from this parable. The first one is that we can raise our children in the truth and be faithful in that and still see them go astray. Secondly, that when they go astray, we need to realize that all is not necessarily lost. And then thirdly, that if the Lord in his mercy brings them back, we need to understand that the fact that they were you know, in a household like this and had all this truth and all this knowledge and all these privileges and they, they abandoned the Lord, that doesn't necessarily mean the Lord will not receive them. Uh, we know there are cases where that happens, but the Lord is telling us here that there is hope for them. So first of all, let's, um, let's consider that we can raise our children in the truth and still see them go astray. Now, Jesus tells us here about a man who had two sons, and I do believe in this particular parable, the man should be seen as the Lord, uh, the Father, okay, the covenant God of Israel. And, of course, that applies to Jesus as well. These, you know, he's the Father, essentially. These are his people, as we saw this morning. That's why he goes after the lost sheep. That's why he goes after the lost coin, because they belong uh, to him. The two sons are his children, of course, Children by adoption, the nation of Israel, in this context. The older son represents the scribes and the Pharisees, those who remain in the house and who at least see themselves as being faithful to the Lord. Now, one thing that we've noticed in these parables is that Jesus is talking about the 99 who haven't gone astray, the nine coins that are still in the purse. Here's the one son who doesn't abandon his father but represents himself as one who has faithfully kept his father's commandments, right? But Jesus said on basically the same occasion that, um, you know, it's not, it's not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those who are sick. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And when Jesus said that, he didn't actually mean that the Pharisees were righteous, but that they viewed themselves in that way. And I think that that's essentially what's going on here. The younger son may think himself to be faithful, but look at how he responds to the younger son when he comes back into the house. So the older son here represents the scribes and the Pharisees who see themselves as faithful to the Lord. The younger son represents, of course, the tax collectors and the sinners, those that go astray. Now, one thing we should notice here is that they were all raised in one house, the father's house. This is the Lord's house. This is his, his covenant community. They're representative, in a sense, of all Israel and the nation of Israel. These were raised, as all Israel was raised, by Jewish parents. Jewish parents who would raise their children according to God's commandments. Uh, they would take their children to the synagogue. The children would be taught God's truth. When it was uh, time, when they reached age, they would celebrate what's called their bar mitzvah, and that would be at around 13 years of age, when the children would be considered old enough to be held accountable for their obedience to the law of God. 
So these children were raised in basically God's house in uh, the covenant nation of Israel. They were raised according to the law of God. But somewhere along the line, each of them took a different path. They took the wrong path. Some of them became Pharisees, okay? Those who tried to justify themselves by the law of God, thinking that they could be good enough. And others turned completely away from the faith. And that would be the tax collectors and sinners. Remember, the tax collectors were those who worked for Rome and were, were helping to get the taxes from Israel for their own benefit as well as Rome. And the Jews hated them. And the sinners were those who basically abandoned the Jewish religion and were living outside the traditions. Jesus is really addressing both in this parable. Now, first of all, we see the younger son come to the father to ask for his inheritance. And we might ask, you know, what, how does this, or what does this actually represent in, in Scripture, in real life? Well, I think here that Jesus is reflecting an idea that we see in other parts of Scripture and perhaps don't think too much about, and that is that the Lord has an inheritance for all of his children, and that really would include, um, you know, believers and unbelievers alike. And some, he tells us, receive this inheritance that God has for them in this world, and others receive it in the world which is coming. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we've already gone through this probably several months ago in Luke chapter 6, what we call the Sermon on the Plain. In verses 24 through 25, listen to what Jesus says to the rich. And I think what in, in this particular context, he actually is referring to the rich and to the poor when we get to the second part. Anyway, so he says this, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Notice the interesting words Jesus used to refer to uh, the rich. He says, you are receiving your comfort in full. What do you mean your comfort? It's the comfort that the Lord intended to give them. They're enjoying it in this life. We see a second example where Abraham is speaking to the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, the rich man at this point has died and, and he's basically in hell. And he's asking for some mercy. He says, send Lazarus just to touch the tip of my tongue with, with a drop of water to, because I'm in agony in these flames. This is what Abraham says to him. Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. Basically, he's saying, you received your good things, and that's all you're going to receive. That was your inheritance in full. And now Lazarus is enjoying his. Now, again, some receive this comfort in this world. Others receive theirs in the world which is to come, where Jesus says in the same context as the first verses I read in the Sermon on the Plain, in verses 20 and 21, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, the general rule seems to be, and it's not an absolute rule because we do know there are exceptions, that the rich are receiving their comforts in this world, but they're going to be poor in the next. And the poor are basically struggling in this world, but they'll be rich in the next. Not, I mean, that's not an absolute rule. It doesn't apply to all rich and all poor. But there is a sense in which it does apply. I mean, listen to what James says in James 2, verse 5. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? I mean, even our Lord Jesus Christ became poor in order that he might make us rich. So there's a sense here in which the inheritance is being given to the son to enjoy the world. This would be his inheritance. The younger son wanted his inheritance now. He wanted to enjoy the world now. And so his father gave him his inheritance and he leaves. Now notice here too that unlike the other parables, that of the sheep and of the coins, the lost son is not near. He's not in the pasture, which is close by, to find the lost sheep. He's not somewhere in the house, okay? 
but he goes far away to a distant country. And notice also that unlike the other parables, the father does not search for the son. At least he's not represented as searching, okay? Uh, we'll consider in a moment that really the father is searching for him. He doesn't, notice, also try to stop him, but he lets him go. And this perhaps represents how strong the young man's desire is for his sin and his father's inability, at least humanly speaking, to stop him from pursuing that sin. I don't suppose any of us have any experience with this with regard to our children. Now, again, we can raise our children in the truth. We can spend the first, I don't know, you know, 18, 20 years of their lives pointing them to Jesus in the gospel, encouraging them to know God and His ways, only to see them walk away. Now, again, I, I had mentioned before um, that there are those in the reform camp who believe that all of our children will ultimately be saved. I really wish that were the case. I really wish that the Bible was clear on that point and said that was the case. I would claim that promise every day and pray for my, for my children. But I don't believe the Bible actually teaches us that. Because if that were true, think about this. The very first believers in the Bible are Adam and Eve, right? If all of their children were saved, were you know, meant to be saved, then where would we be today? Uh, we'd be in a much better place, wouldn't we? Because everybody in the world would be Christians. But such is not the case. We generally find that in, in the Scripture, not all the children of even the godliest people that we find, the godliest parents, were necessarily saved. Do you think all of Abraham's children were saved? Uh, certainly Ishmael wasn't. And you know that Abraham married Ketera and had many other children, and we don't read about the salvation of any of those. Uh, Samuel's children... We, we just went through, or I think actually we're reading through 1 Samuel now, aren't we? So we're going to find that um, Samuel's children are not going to walk in his ways. And so um, the, the people of Israel want somebody else uh, to judge them. So Samuel's children apparently weren't walking in, in the Lord's ways. And David, even during the time of his faithfulness, who had many wives and many children, we see some of his children actually doing uh, quite wicked things. Now that's just to name a few. But consider, again, Abraham, consider all of his children, consider the nation of Israel. Though the children of Israel, and Israel, you know, technically is Jacob. Even though the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it's only the remnant that is going to be saved. So the Bible doesn't necessarily say that all of our children are going to be saved. We can raise them perhaps uh, as best as anyone can raise them and they can still not come to faith in Christ. And when they don't believe, and they want to leave, as R.C. Sproul reminded us in, on one of the videos we watched recently during Reformation, sometimes the best thing to do is to let them go, to let them, you know, give them over to, uh, to their sins and, and not, not try to hold them back anymore. We can't ultimately hold them back. That's really something only the Lord can do. But... We have to basically let go of them and give them into the hands of the Lord. And that brings us to the second point. Even though they turn from him, we need to realize that not all is lost. The Lord will be faithful to deal with them. Now, at first, everything, you know, that uh, was, was basically going the son's way. He had money, you know, and money is <laughs> what really... Um, the people of this world need to have fun, okay? So he had money, he had friends, he was able to indulge in the pleasures of the world. Apparently one of those pleasures was prostitutes, as we see at the end of this parable. So indulging in wickedness, but soon all of his money was gone, reminding us of what Solomon writes in, in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. It, it's, it, it's, you know, a wise saying, every time I read it, I can't help but chuckle. He says this, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. You know, that, so basically, we can't hold on to it. We shouldn't be pursuing it. And this young man thought his life consisted of his possessions, but he soon found that it, 
his wealth took wings and, and flew away from him, and he was left destitute. So that's what happens. And he begins to experience, for the first time in his life, what it meant not to have enough. And then things got harder. There was a severe famine, and he began to be in need. And then things got even harder. He looked for work, and the only work he could find was feeding pigs. And those who sent him out into the field to feed the pigs took advantage of him and weren't even willing to give him what they were feeding their animals. But we do need to realize that hardship can be beneficial because the hardship began to change this man's heart and bring him to his senses. It turned him back towards home. He began to think about his father's servants. I mean, even his hired men have enough to eat while he was dying from hunger. And it brought him to humble himself. He realized that he had sinned against God, he had sinned against his father, that he was no longer worthy to be part of his family. So he would go to his father and beg him to take him as one of his servants. And so he set out to return to his father. Now, again, Jesus is representing here the tax collectors and the sinners because this is what they were doing. They were coming to Jesus in order to listen to him. Uh, the Lord was working in their lives. And this reminds us that just because our children leave doesn't mean that God is done with them, whether they leave our homes, whether they leave the church. Because I believe that what God said to, to Abraham in the Old Covenant, and this is perhaps a disputed uh, point on maybe a couple of different, uh, in a couple of different areas, but we do believe that this applies to our children today when he says, I will be a God to you and to your descendants after you. And we believe it in the same sense that he meant it to, to Israel, which uh, meant that he would be faithful to deal with them as a father deals with his children. And we, we see that doesn't necessarily mean that all Israel, uh, all of Abraham's natural children uh, are going to be saved. But it does mean that God is faithful to deal with them. And I think we see in the entire history of the Old Testament, God dealing with his children. When they go astray, he disciplines them. When they come back to him, he blesses them because they are his children. I believe that this also applies to our children in the new covenant. Now, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that God's going to save them, as, we've, as I've already noted. But it does mean, and he may, but he will be faithful to work in their lives, to bring them to their senses perhaps, show them the truth, even to discipline them. He disciplined Israel on a number of occasions that they might turn back to him. I mean, after all, who was it that sent the famine, you know, into the land and made the, uh, the life miserable for the prodigal? Okay, it was, it was God who was working to lead him back to his home. The Lord may allow our children to enjoy sin for a season, but eventually, and I think this is absolute, he will make the fun dry up and things will become hard for them because you know, the, the wages of sin are always bad and they will have to face them, I think, in this life and certainly in the life to come if they don't turn. So what we need to be doing is if we let them go, we need to be praying that God would send difficulties. We need to pray that he would use those difficulties to humble them and to cause them to return, that he might have mercy upon them. And then finally, if they return, we need to know the Lord will receive them. Now, again, I only bring this up as a point because um, we need to understand they, they, they don't commit the unpardonable sin if in their ignorance and their blindness they, they depart from the Lord for a time. When the son was a long ways off, we read that his father saw him. And he felt compassion for him. He ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. His son attempted to express all that was in his heart towards his father, that, that he had sinned against him, that he was no longer worthy to be called his son. But before he got to the part about taking him as one of his servants, his father had called his ser to his servants, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring for his hand. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the fattened calf and prepare for a celebration because my son was dead and is now alive. He was lost, but now he's found. And again, just because our children leave, having enjoyed all the privileges of being raised in a Christian household, 
That doesn't mean it's hopeless for them. The Lord may yet call them back to himself, and if they come back to him, obviously in his mercy, he will receive them into his family. And I don't think there's any question that we will do the same thing. We certainly should not hold anything against them, but desire their salvation. That's what our Lord has been teaching us, right, is to desire the salvation of the lost, no matter how far away they go, including those closest to us. As a matter of fact, Jesus warns us against the contrary attitude in the reaction of the older brother. When he returned from the field, he heard the celebration and he asked the servants what was, what was going on. And they told him it was because his father had received his brother back safe and sound. And Jesus tells us the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. Just as the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw Jesus receiving the tax collectors and the sinners, they refused to accept that. They refused to go in and to do the same. So the father came out to him to plead with him to come in. Just as Jesus was reproving these Pharisees that they might change their mind and come in and celebrate and rejoice in the fact that these sinners were coming to him. The older son argued that he had served his father faithfully for many years and had never neglected any of his commandments, and yet he had never given to him even a young goat to celebrate with his friends. But for this son who had devoured his wealth on prostitutes, he killed the fattened calf. Jesus was receiving and celebrating these outcasts who had spent their entire lives offending God, but he wasn't doing this. He wasn't, you know, uh, spending time with the religious leaders, even though they thought they had been faithful. Again, Jesus pointing out the contrast. And so the father said to the older brother, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Instead of being offended, Jesus is telling these leaders they should be rejoicing with him that these sinners were coming to God. Now, one thing Jesus doesn't include in the parable because it's yet to be seen is how the older brother is going to respond to this, right? Is he going to do the right thing or is he going to do the wrong thing? Now, we know from what we read in Scripture that very few of the Pharisees actually did the right thing. They remained Pharisees. Um, a few of them did, but most of them did not. And, of course, Jesus is telling us not to respond like Pharisees to any of, of even the, the most distant outcasts if they come to him, and certainly not to our children. No matter how far they've fallen away from him or what they've done, the Lord will receive them and we should receive them as well. Now again, as I said before, we don't have an ironclad promise in here that the Lord is going to have mercy on our children any more than we do that he would have mercy on anyone. This is in the sovereign hands of God. Okay, he is the one who saves, right? But we must never give up hoping in his sovereign goodness that you know, we have to remember that the only reason why anyone comes to him, the only reason why we came to him is not because we saw our need of him. It was because he had mercy upon us. He showed mercy upon us. That's the only reason anyone comes to the Lord, and that's the only reason why they would ever come to the Lord. And we need to understand that he may yet have mercy on them. And if he does, and only if he does, then they will come. I was kind of hoping that... Um, uh, Jamie and, and Janice will be here this evening because I have a quote from one of their um, uh, relatives uh, who was a Puritan. I don't know that he was a relative, but his name is John Barlow. And he was a Puritan who believed in the sovereignty of God. And I think what he says here is, is very encouraging. And really, this is our hope, the sovereign goodness of God. This is what he writes. Whom he chooses shall be created, called, justified, sanctified, glorified, because his purpose cannot be altered, his promise revoked. Let Manasseh repair the high places, rear altars for Baal, the prodigal run from his father, drink and swiftly consume his portion, Saul make havoc of the saints, put them in prison, do many things against Jesus of Nazareth, yet shall they come to themselves mourn for their sins, 
and be saved, for they are elected, beloved of him who is the same forever. We need to understand that God's mercy is our only hope. And so we need to put our trust entirely in the Lord and seek after him for the salvation of our prodigals. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord uh, to do that, to give us the grace to seek him.